guys being a macro luce è perché il, il proiettore secondo me bisogna cambiare la lampada se posso rispondere quindi c'è so uh, welcome everybody to the global lecture hall to be to yet another edition of a shanghai uh lectures 2015 we are in 2015 i would say that the key uh keywords uh, this year will be interaction and the student uh, active uh, involvement uh, in the lecture um so i'm uh, you may know i'm fabio bonsignori i am a professor here at the biorobotics institute uh, in pisa in the scuola superiore sant'anna which means uh, something like uh, Institu uh, Saint, Anne, Saint, Saint Anne Institute of Advanced Studies. And uh, actually, together with uh, several other colleagues, uh, first of all, uh, our mentor and the founder of Shanghai Lectures, Rolf Pfeiffer and then Verena Hafner and many um, other uh, guest speakers, uh, we will um, discuss uh, this general issue which is uh, the issue of uh, what's natural and artificial intelligence um, you know that uh, we, we have been a lot of discussion on uh, on ai uh, and you know suddenly uh, thanks to people like elon musk or stephen hawking um, actually not uh specialist research in ai i would say uh, it seems that we are very close uh, to to see ai real ai so ai with capability human like or even superhuman uh, capabilities mm, let's say that many things that this might not be for tomorrow and maybe not even for the day after tomorrow yet uh, conceptually the problem exists um, another issue that has been raised, uh, uh, especially in the US, and this is one of the many books uh, approaching this problem, is the fact uh, that uh, there is a, a study, we, we will go see this uh, in much more detail during the lecture, but someone is worried that uh, AI and robots uh, may more or less destroy uh, the jobs landscape. No? So, someone, there is a study from, Ox, from a group of uh, Oxford researchers more or less suggesting that half of the jobs uh, are in peril uh, in the next few years. Uh, this might be more true than uh, the perspective or robotics uh, uh, take and AI taking over the world, no? so the superhuman artificial intelligence enslaving humans. This seems very far in the future. While uh, uh, for sure the possibility that we can automate uh, uh, a lot of jobs that before were not possible was not possible to to automate uh, create some challenges, challenges and opportunities, uh, because uh, the idea. At, at the current status of AI and robotics, what we can automate uh, are dumb, uh, repetitive jobs, in term, in, in, seen from the intellectual standpoint. If it doesn't require creativity, if, if it is very repetitive, uh, um, so if, if, if it bores you, it can be automated. So is this a real issue? Maybe no, but for sure it's a big challenge uh, for society. Uh? So we, we, you know that uh, a typical uh, argument uh, used uh, by the techno-optimists, no? because uh, usually we, we have two factions, the ludists, so people fearing machines, fearing that machines will uh, subvert society, will uh, create a, a nightmare like we, we can still uh, read in some uh, Dickens novel. Uh, and other techno optimists think, no, no, everything will go well and the system, the market will self-organize uh, and solve all the issues. It's possible, well, this is my opinion, not everybody have to agree with it, it's possible the solution is uh, 
somehow in the middle. Of. For sure, and, and a lot of new jobs will will be created in areas where today we, that today we don't even imagine. On the other hand, uh, many of current uh, jobs, and I underline again the boring ones, uh, will probably disappear. So it might be five years, might be ten years. And I would also add that considering the challenges that uh, we have in front of us, climate change and, and overpopulation, uh, we definitely need a, a steep increase in productivity. But this is something. But what I want to, to underline here is that there are a lot of... Uh, so AI is in the media. You have a lot uh, of possible questions uh, you, you hear a lot of different opinions and uh, you need to, to have uh, a, an informed opinion on that. So the goals of, of, um, of our lectures are, first of all, of, um, which, uh, of a scientific and also cultural uh, aspect. So what... So what, 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 what what's What's intelligence? Mm -hmm. So we, uh, I hope that later on and through all the lecture we will see that the answer is not uh, as immediate uh, as you may imagine. So is it what is measured by, I, I, by the uh, IQ? So should I simply build a machine with a, a speech interface or even a text interface and perform uh, ask the machine to perform the standard tests uh, that usually are and, and see what happens. So this, uh, by the way, is not so difficult so far uh, in the future. Uh, something that for which a machine could be programmed uh, with not much thought. And then you may have read that last uh, year um, someone pretended that uh, um, a machine had passed the Turing test in the UK. So it, it will, is that true or is not true? So if you, again, inform the opinion of media, you know, because you read a, really a lot of things. Now, really the Turing test has been passed last year, so AI is solved. So we, we may, people like, uh, we should just think of uh, uh, implementing new marvelous product, uh, products uh, on the basis of this AI. So we are in a poor application stage, or we still have some open issue. My opinion, and I think many agree on that, is that there are still many open issues, but which ones and uh, how we can uh, um, attack them and then there is another thing, there, uh, there are different ways to, talk, to think about uh, the problem of uh, um, artificial intelligence. Not, uh, it's not a, um, by chance that uh, these uh, lectures are on natural and artificial intelligence. So we don't see artificial intelligence just as a poor, just as a very useful technology uh, tool alone. We also see artif artificial, we also want to reverse engineer the intelligence, uh, behavior, intelligent behaviors that we see in nature. So we also see the study of intelligence as a way to understand ourself, uh, 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 ourselves and the uh, animal kingdom. And, and we will see, uh, you may already know if you are already in this, uh, in this course that uh, we have uh, at least uh, we have uh, a at least a two, extreme <laughs> extreme. Uh, I see some life from Osaka. <laughs> no? So it seems that uh, no? So this different way to, to see intelligence that can be, uh, I think that this will be the topic of the very first lecture today, if uh, Rolf succeed in, uh, in, to connect uh, with us. Uh, at least you have the, the so-called symbolic paradigm and the embodied or emergentist paradigm. And then uh, you, you will discover 
If you just browse the long list of lectures uh, in the lecture repository on the website of the Shanghai Lecture, you will see that there are significantly divergent opinions on many not so small details. So it's an open field. I, if I, I think that for a young student like uh, most of you, uh, but also for everybody working in, in, in research in, in, in this field, uh, this Shanghai lecture are an, an interesting uh, enterprise. Uh, as uh, uh, we will, uh, as you know, we will uh, um, also rise uh, propose to, to students, a group of students which are supposed to be international, so to spread uh, among different universities and involving people from different uh, uh, language groups, uh, uh, we will propose what we call as koans. Uh, uh, the koans in the Zing practice uh, are a kind of challenge that the teacher uh, poses to, to the student uh, with the purpose of the student uh, reaching the enlightenment. Uh, so the idea of Zen practice is that something cannot be directly taught. So I, I cannot just list you a, a, a series of properties and laws and you simply uh, read them and then repeat them. No? If we, when we will talk about, for instance, the Chinese room experiment, uh, you, we, you, you may uh, think that uh, actually this idea of how you teach people is related to what you think intelligence is uh, and what, uh, what you think knowledge is. So, uh, actually, uh, one of the characteristics, uh, there, there were some talks also in, in, um, that you can find uh, in, in the repository, actually, the, the think, uh, researching the nature of intelligence and robotics is much more a serious enterprise than you may immediately think. It's not just building nice toys, but it's really um, raising questions and trying to give answer to some very Fundamental issue. So, for instance, uh, uh, what, what does it mean to 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 have uh, followed with um, success uh, a university teaching, in particular on AI? So this is why we 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 scores, so these challenges, which are kind of uh, exam project work, but uh, uh, are designed to be really challenging, meaning that uh, you are not supposed that to have already read uh, any, any somewhere how to solve the exercise. You have to invent your own solution to the exercise. The idea is that in the process you, you make, uh, uh, you really um, interject uh, your, uh, uh, the principle that you are trying to, to push. Uh, and then, as uh, far as we, we use, uh, I see here, yeah, it's a, actually it's a chance. No? So, so it's by chance uh, a, a PDF translation problem created this nice uh, uh, slide. No? In, we actually refer for, for the classes uh, to on a tech, main textbook. Other um, textbooks uh, can be found on the website. And this textbook is the book by Rolf that uh, you may start to see in, in the Osaka uh, Square in, your, uh, in the video conference. Uh, yeah, is the man waving the hand. Uh, the, this book uh, um, is how the body shapes the way we think, a new view of intelligence, which is, uh, and you can see the main author there uh, scrubbing his head. And um, so, but if you want to uh, ju let just finish uh, touch on this point, uh, actually, we, this is not a, a mock. No, our idea is that this is a, a big lecture hall. So you, you may have already noticed 
that there are some technical glitches and uh, this is not so immediate, but uh, it's a nice experiment. And we have been helping in the past, uh, um, in the past lectures and I think uh, it will be very uh, inspiring uh, for, uh, and for us uh, also this new edition. So I, if uh, Rolf uh, is ready, are you Rolf? Uh, I would be happy to. Can you hear me? Can you yes, hear me at all? Yes, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yes, if you are ready to start, uh, I, I can. Uh, I, uh, I just so this is Rolf Pfeiffer. <laughs> Rolf Pfeiffer uh, is, uh, I think, one of the leading thinker in. Um, in AI, and uh, as, as told, uh, is I think that it is uh, a book uh, our body shapes the, the way we think it is a kind of milestone in uh, in the AI in AI research. And uh, I want to say that many of the ideas that Rolf already um, raised, uh, um, elaborated, uh, and published many years ago are actually uh, still a challenge and still open research issues. So things uh, that uh, are meant uh, to think about. So uh, let me introduce uh, Rolf Pfeiffer, Emeritus Professor <laughs> on, uh, of the uh, uh, University uh, of Zurich and now a professor also in the Osaka, University of Osaka and Shanghai Yao Tong. So, Rolf, the floor is yours when you are ready. And if you are ready. Can you see anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. excellent, okay. thanks. So, we had, okay. Uh, welcome everybody to the morning, afternoon, good evening. I'm very happy that we finally managed to connect uh, and we had some logistic problems so that the video conference was set up on a different campus and uh, I was unaware of that and it would have taken us an hour and a half to move to the other campus so we quickly tried to install the video conference here so but let's just uh, not do too much talking and just get started now. I don't know all the details that you already uh, told us, Fabio, but I'm very happy to see all the sites connected again. I see people who have uh, participated for the last couple of years uh, from all over the world. I think it's a great it's a great feeling to pre to feel uh, to be present in the global video conference again. I think I need to see if I can adjust the camera a little better here. Okay, yeah, I think maybe this is better, yeah, okay, good. So some of it will probably be repetition, but let me just uh, uh, point out uh, the just the global geography. Some of you may not be very familiar where Osaka is. It's in uh, Japan. So you can see Tokyo, you can see Shanghai, just for reference, on the left. It's just a two hours, very close together, it's just a two hours flight. Today we we're broadcasting from Osaka University, and I will be talking, I think uh, Fabio already gave an introduction to uh, intelligence, uh, what it is all about. So I go through some of this stuff quickly. I saw this slide was also used by Fabio. So let me... Let me just briefly mention, you know, what is intelligence, natural or artificial? And uh, maybe we can have a question to the global video conference. When, you know, we all sort of have the impression that we know exactly what we mean by intelligence. But then what exactly, if, if you're trying to pin down exactly what it is, it turns out to be very difficult. So if I ask you now, what is intelligence? What is intelligence? What would you say? Maybe we can have the local audience here in Osaka, or we can have uh, people from anywhere on the planet answering. Do you have any, any one uh, suggestion of 
what intelligence is all about, sort of intuitively, what do you think intelligence is? Yeah, there is uh, in Humboldt we University have, uh, in Verena. Yes, okay. hello, Rob. Hi. Uh, we, have, uh, we have one suggestion here. Uh, I have two definitions. I think um, intelligence uh, is problem solving would be one. Okay, and problem yeah, solving. Would yep. be, uh, intelligence is the uh, ability to recognize patterns. Ah, the so, ability to recognize uh, patterns and problem solving. Yeah, I think very good points. Okay. Excellent. Do we have other suggestions? Okay, I have one. How about learning? Would that be something? <laughs> I mean, a system that cannot learn, you know, you would hardly call uh, intelligent, right? What else? It's a sort of um, evolution strategy of the cognitive systems, based on cognitive system. Evolution strategy? You briefly elaborate? Of some, of some organisms, some animals, that invest more in the cognitive systems than... Um, ah, cognitive systems, uh -huh. okay. Okay, other suggestions or shall we leave it? Uh, what about language? I think language would be an important one. Depends on what kind of language, you know, is it natural language as we use it? Or could it be some other kind of language as maybe used by animals? So I think we can, we can come up with a couple of characteristics of uh, intelligent systems intuitively like that. Now, the, let me see, let me see. So we want to get, so one of the goals here is to get a feel for what intelligence is all about. The goal here, when we talk about the goals, so it's, you know, what is intelligence? Uh, you should also get some technical, conceptual know-how, and you should also be able to get an informed opinion on media reports, and I think Fabio mentioned that before. Let me just give a few examples of what I mean. Here is a recent one from Japan Times, the Pepper Robot. Actually, we have one here in the office, the Pepper Robot by SoftBank. SoftBank is a large telecommunication company in Japan, and they developed this uh, robot Pepper, and Nestle is a Swiss company. Nestle is, you know, well known for the Nespresso machines advertised by George Clooney. They rented a thousand uh, of these robots to sell Nespresso machines to customers in Japan. Now, what should we think about that? Now, here is a good one. So, a drunken Kanagawa man arrested after kicking SoftBank robot. So, this guy was apparently frustrated with the personnel and then he got angry and he started you know, kicking the robots. So the life for the robots is also getting tougher and more dangerous. And then there is a, one that I particularly like and I have to admit don't understand, fully understand SoftBank warns against sex with, an, with its Android Pepper. I'm not quite sure you know, what, that, what they actually mean by this. Anyhow, but it's fun. And then another recent item in Japan Times was that language learning Watson looks to change the face of computing. So Watson, what is Watson? Anyone knows uh, Watson by uh, IBM? Maybe a question or local audience, maybe you can, you can. The supercomputer. A supercomputer, yes, definitely. Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, yes. Uh, huh? Built to play the game of Jeopardy, which is a very successful, very popular uh, video conference. It's a quiz, a kind of a quiz. So Watson understands, understands between quotation marks, natural language, has a huge database, can answer questions. It can also inspect medical records, and it can do a kind of data mining big big data analysis and then come up with suggestions on particular diagnosis. 
And here it's just the, the Jeopardy winning computer. Another goal is that we would like to show that things can always be seen differently. We always think it has to be this way. How else could it be? For example, a computer, you know, we're used to thinking in terms of input processing output. And one model that most people have of humans at some level, at some level of abstraction, is there's some input through the senses, there is some processing, and then there is some output. You know, I say something, I say a few words, I move. Or, so input, processing, output. Now, as we will show as we go along, this notion is about as wrong as it is compelling. It does not, it applies to computers, it does not apply to natural forms of intelligence. So stay, stay tuned for explanations of why this is the case. I think Fabio already mentioned that. This is the book for the class. We can have it in uh, Japanese or in Chinese, or it's also, you can have it in, in French. This is an older version or this uh, understanding intelligence. Uh, I think it's a very nice book, but it has one big flaw, and that is it's 700 pages. So I think most people will not want to read 700 pages. Okay, so today's topics, let's see how far we get. Characterize intelligence, thinking, cognition, we already did that in the introduction. Then I would like to introduce the Turing test and the Chinese uh, room experiment, also mentioned by Fabio. In his introduction, I will say something about intelligence testing, artificial intelligence and its goals, and introduce the synthetic methodology. We already did some characterization of intelligence. And one, let's say, what people would like to have, and I'm often asked, can you give us a definition of intelligence? You have been working, or I've been working in artificial intelligence or intelligence research in general for 25 years, at least 30 years. So I should be able to give a definition of intelligence, but I refuse to give a definition. It's, it's just simply not possible. So this is from the Penguin Dictionary of Psychology, and they say few concepts in psychology have received more devoted attention and few have resisted clarification so thoroughly. So, you know, really, Hundreds of thousands of people, researchers, philosophers, linguists, have tried to elucidate the concept of intelligence, but uh, we haven't been very successful. Now, let me just give you some examples of definitions. This is from an issue, uh, 1927, of a psychology journal, and they asked the leading psychologists at the time to give their definitions of intelligence. <laughs> Let me just point out some here. So uh, the let's, for example, look at yeah the third one down the ability to adapt oneself adequately to relatively new situations in life. Now, what's a word like relatively new situation got to do in a definition? What is a relatively new thing? I mean, you can't use that in a definition. And then you go down. To the next one, a biological mechanism by which the effects of a complexity of stimuli are brought together and given a somewhat unified effect in behavior. Again, what is a somewhat unified effect in behavior in a definition? So you see, I think it's going to be very difficult. And this is a quote by Robert Sternberg, one of the eminent psychologists at Tufts University in Boston in the United States, and he said, there seem to be almost as many definitions of intelligence as there were experts asked to define it. So, you know, many definitions. If you read them, uh, by the way, we uploaded a paper to the website, to the Shanghai Lectures website, and if you, read, it's full of definitions of, of uh, intelligence. They are all plausible, but you know, they don't really cover the concept. So I think. Uh, the, uh, yeah, Leg and Hutter, they collected, I mean, you know, what a task. They just collected definitions of intelligence. And then they come up with a new definition. Let me just look at this. Intelligence measures an agent's ability to achieve goals in a wide range of environments. Well, it sounds okay, right? But then 
what do they do? They basically move all the, all the content into this word, the buzzword goals. What is a goal? Now let's take an example. You have an ant and the ant finds a piece of food, for example, a dead insect or something and brings it back to the nest and dumps it into the nest. Has it achieved a goal? Yes. That, and then the question is, we'll talk about that next time. It's a frame of reference issue. Whose goal? I mean, I can say the ant achieved the goal, but does the ant itself have a representation of the goal? Say, I want to get this insect. I want to dump it into the thing and then dump it and then say, wow, now I achieved the goal. Probably not. So is that a goal? Is it not a goal? Let me give you another example. In, uh, in Germany, they did a very interesting experiment in a movie theater. And so they basically, at the entrance of the movie theater, they distributed bags with popcorn to the visitors. And they had two sizes of popcorn. Uh, two sizes of bags, same, same quantity of popcorn, but two sizes of bags, small ones and bigger ones. And uh, they knew exactly the weight of the popcorn. And I think those who participated in the experiment, they got a discount on the ticket. And so they went in, you know, sorry, eat, watching the movie, eating popcorn. And when they came out, they weighed the bags with the popcorn. And I mean, you can probably guess the ones that had the bigger bags consistently, very significantly, had eaten more popcorn than the ones with the small bags. But there were no instructions. They were just eating more. Did they have the goal to eat more than the others? That was just happening, basically. They were just eating more. So I just want to get you to think about the term goal. What do we really mean when we say someone has a goal? And so maybe it's not such a great definition after all, you know what? But please interrupt me and tell me that I'm completely wrong. But we've been trying to figure out what we could mean by a goal for a long time. There is another difficulty in defining intelligence. It's very subjective. So I can play chess, right? But I'm a very mediocre chess player. So if you were to watch me play a game of chess, you would probably not be very impressed by my level of intelligence. However, let's do an experiment. Let's replace myself by a little girl, one-year-old, two-year-old girl, and the girl would make exactly the same moves in the game of chess as I did. So the behavior is exactly the same. Then you would say, wow, this girl is super intelligent. And if you replace the girl by a dog, say, well, the dog would make the same movements, you would say, well, the dog is probably a genius, right? So we have subjective expectations. And depending on the expectations, even if the behavior is exactly the same, depending on the expectations, we could, one case we call it intelligent, and the other maybe not so intelligent. So it's a mess. I'm trying to sort of convince you that trying to define intelligence is a real mess. So. It's better not to. It's better not to really try a definition or argue what is intelligent. What is. So, for example, I mean, can we come up with necessary and sufficient? <coughs> That's what you need for a definition, right? In mathematics, okay. No way. Question: Are robots or ants? Let's think ants. Are ants intelligent? Do we have? A statement from the video global video conference: Are ants intelligent? Are ants intelligent? Maybe we can. Yeah. Who would argue that ants are intelligent? Would anyone argue that ants are intelligent? Well, I would. Okay. 
Let me give you, let me give you, ah, yeah, here we go. As population. Right, so they are collectively intelligent, maybe not so much as an individual. Yes, I think it's a very good point. So in some sense, they collaborate. And the ability to collaborate is definitely a sign of intelligence, right? I think someone mentioned that at the beginning. Yeah. Okay, well, they can, they can learn. They have good learning abilities. They have outstanding navigational skills. They have very complex social organizations, and so on and so forth. I can also give you arguments, or maybe someone else can do that, give me, me arguments why ants are not to be considered intelligent. What, yes? Well, certain ants might appear to have pretty intelligent behavior, but it turns out that they don't. Like one example I read about was the leaf cutter ant, that uh, they climb onto the leaves and cut a piece out to, to bring back, to build their nest. And you might think, oh, isn't that really clever? But after cutting a segment out of the leaf, there's a 50% chance that they will like, let that piece fall because they grab another part of the leaf to carry it away. Ah, OK. So, so OK, so uh, maybe I, I, repeat the, uh, I repeat the example. So you know, they, they cut leaves, the cutter ants, they cut uh, pieces of leaves to take back to the nest and build some structures. But then <laughs> instead of grasping, in 50% of the cases, instead of grasping the piece that they actually cut off, they grasp the other part of the leaf. So you know, not, not very, not what, what you would expect from a truly intelligent uh, being, right? Yes. Right, also, uh, do they have language? Poo, certainly not like human beings. They cannot do math, or at least we assume they cannot do math. So, you know, there are many reasons why it might not make so much sense. Oh, and their neural system is very hardwired. You know, it's not not very uh, flexible, not very uh, adaptable. So, there, we can give five reasons why ants sensibly should be considered intelligent, and five reasons why they sensibly should not be considered intelligent. Okay, so what? Are they intelligent now or not? I think it's a mute point. Oh, here we had three pros and cons. I think the more productive question is, rather than asking, is this intelligent or is it not intelligent, is to say, okay, here we have a behavior that we're interested in. How do ants find their way back to the nest? Or how do they form an ant trail, you know, like collective intelligence? And then ask the question, how does it come about? How does it work? And not argue whether that is intelligent or not. I think it's a mute point. OK, so let's go with this one, with this more productive question. And I think a, uh, a good way, or what people do all the time, teachers do it, but we do it with other people, we observe other people, you know, the way they talk, the way they interact, or whatever they do. And then we form an opinion of whether we consider them to be intelligent or not. We do that continuously with everybody. OK, so let's have a few examples. Uh, not done, can we have a couple of videos? The RoboV first. So, you know, children, it's about children observing a robot and trying to figure out whether the robot, interacting with the robots, trying to figure out whether it's intelligent. Can we have the first one, RoboV? Which was actually developed here at Osaka University of Japan. This research group of Ishiguro Hiroshi さんたちが活も大きなテーマです。人と友達になれるロボットを目指して開発されたロボビー。This is very old. This is like a ten years old. This is Shiro Shiro. ロボビーは言葉を交わしたり体に触れ合うことで人とコミュニケーションが取れるように設計されています腕や腹など16箇所にある銀色のシートは感圧センサーです人の皮膚に当たり触ると敏感に反応します
相手からの働きかけに対し800通りの行動パターンを自分で判断して返しますセンサーを撫でられたり優しい言葉をかけられると人に甘える仕草も見せます。しかし、実社会に出してみると、まだ課題が山積みであることが分かってきました。小学校でロボビーに英語を話させ、海外からの転校生として、子どもたちと友達になれるか観察しました。あちこちのセンサーを触られ複数の子どもから話しかけられたロボディは誰と話していいか分からず混乱してしまったのです OK I think we can、uh... Have another one. Nata, can we switch to the next one? The Larsen Bird, which was developed at the,、uh, at the Bristol、uh, Robotics Laboratory. I think that's very ingenious. Hello, Bert.、Um, I'd just like to talk to you about the. Sorry, there's a guy talking、on. to this robot.、Uh, it's all about using non verbal gestures and utterances.、Oh. And we use these to try and convince someone talking to a robot that it is listening and understanding what they say. Um, you getting this so far? Okay, good.、Um, we do this by listening for pauses in their speech, like that one,、uh, <coughs> and then responding to that with the appropriate nods and gestures, like we would.、Uh, did you get all that? Okay, good. Okay. Okay, you saw this one. I mean, this also this demonstrates how easily. I mean, this, this guy, this robot, doesn't understand anything. It basically just nods and occasionally says, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, and like this. Doesn't understand anything. But still, you get the impression wow, you know, he or it understands me, right? So it shows how easily people are tricked into believing that someone is very intelligent. We sort of project our own ideas onto the robot. So it takes very little to make others believe that we're intelligent. You know, if you don't talk too much, but just say you know, you nod, and people always think you understand. And、uh, well, maybe I think do we have to? What about time? Do we have to? Are we short of time, or is it okay? Not done? Huh? Fabio? Ah. Yes, yes, take it some time. I think you can take、uh, 15 minutes still. 15 minutes? Okay, fair. Yeah, yeah.、So、We shorten a bit the side presentations. Okay, go ahead. So maybe, maybe I should uh, uh, let's, let's forget about the ICOP attention video、um, and go on to the next、uh, important point of the day, which is this.、Uh, Famous、uh, Turing, Turing test. So, Turing was very interested in the topic of intelligence. Turing test. So, Alan Turing, you know, one of the co inventors of computers, inventor of the term computation. And he was thinking a lot about intelligence. And he was frustrated with. People saying, well, but you know, are ants intelligent? Or is that really intelligence? But no, it's not really intelligence. You know, it's like he says, these discussions are totally useless. What we need is an empirical test. And we perform the test, and then we can say yes or no. Right? That's what he wanted to have as a real scientist. And he then, in this、uh, In a famous paper in the 1950s, he suggested the so called imitation game. And it's basically you have behind a wall, you have either a human being or a computer, and then you have an interrogator. And the interrogator, by asking questions, tries to find out whether 
the individual behind the screen or in the other room is a human or is a computer. And that, I mean, and that's often used now in the, there are a number of versions of this, but let's just have a quick look at this. It's actually the case that uh, the Turing's version was slightly more sophisticated. And he said, well, we have two people. We have an interrogator, C, we have two people, a man, uh, and the man, A, has the task to try and confuse the interrogator. And the woman has to help the interrogator. Now, the, the interrogator could, for example, ask, well, do you have, at the time, you know, women had long hair and men had short hair. So it could ask, well, do women have, uh, or do you have long hair? Now, if the man is answering, then of course he can lie, right? And I think the ability to lie and to construct a world which is not the one that really exists is part, in, in Turing's view, part of intelligence. And so that's why he wanted to have this more sophisticated question. And then the, the interrogator has to say, has to be able to say, like, uh, Y, position Y is the man or is the woman, and position X is the man, you know, which is a more complicated version of it. But normally what people do is they just use computer or human being behind the wall. You can, in the documentation, in the slides, you will find the description. I have it here. I'm not going to go through the details. You can look at it. Uh, yourselves. Now, what's interesting about the Turing test, well, maybe we, we stay with the Turing test for a second before we go on. Is the Turing test a good test for intelligence? Do you think it's a good test for intelligence? Maybe the global video conference? Would anyone venture an opinion from Plymouth? Yes, it's a good test. Yes, OK, Plymouth? Yeah. Uh, UK, in, Plymouth, UK? Yeah, sorry, Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's limited in that it's mostly test communication, which is not always a variable of intelligence, or at least trying to communicate with a human. You wouldn't necessarily have to be able to communicate with in a human-like way to actually be able to show intelligence. So basically, you're saying, it may not, from that point of view, it may not be a very good test, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Do we have other opinions? One more from Plymouth? So, yeah. OK, another, think, another point, yeah. I think that this is a bad um, test because it shows it's trying to represent near human intelligence rather than sort of lower forms where it isn't based on communication, the same as uh, the other student in Plymouth. Oh, didn't quite know our, our, our sound system is a bit uh, messed up here, so I didn't okay. get the details. Um, I mean, one, I think one of the problems with the test is it's based on natural language. You know, the communication is all natural language. So it wouldn't apply to animals. But then there are other forms of the test where we actually see the complete, the complete uh, person. And then it's called the total Turing test, where the appearance also has to be indistinguishable from a human, which then is called the total Turing test. Not only this, this one only applies to language, but the nice thing about it is it's an empirical test, and you can say yes or no. And it's applied actually in, in many ways now. And um, I mean, it's also with humans, when you, when you uh, talk to humans, then um, you basically, you know, you basically, so, so some of the criticisms are that it's only input-output behavior. So basically, 
you say something and you get something in return. And for example, Searle in this Chinese room thought experiment, which I'm not going to go into the details, please, please read it uh, in the slides. And I hope that we can find some volunteers. Maybe I have, yeah. yeah. Maybe we can find some volunteers, student volunteers, hopefully from China, to make a brief presentation next week about this uh, thought experiment, I think, because it's a Chinese room. It will be very suitable to have a Chinese site. I think we have, what, Xi'an and, uh, and Shanghai, of course, Jiaodong University, as potential candidates. So one of the arguments of Searle is that this is based purely on input-output behavior and that this is not, a, let's say, appropriate account of intelligence. I mean, it goes deeper. It's a relatively complicated story, but hopefully we have a presentation next week about that. Okay. Now, historically, there have been many variations of the Turing test. ELISA, the doctor program, which is actually 1966. And what Weizenbaum did, uh, he was a professor, uh, Josef Weizenbaum was a professor at MIT. And he developed this program, ELISA, or doc called doctor program, it was a kind of psychotherapist. And what he is exploiting is, again, our penchant. Humans always project their own ideas and feelings into the environment. And like here is a good one. So they had a visitor from Russia at MIT, and the doctor program says, good afternoon, please type in your name. The visitor did so, and the doctor continued with some polite preliminaries. And then the program says, what brought you here to see me today? And the visitor says, oh, nothing much. I'm feeling a bit tired, that's all. Program says, why do you think you're feeling a bit tired? Then visitor says, well, I've been traveling a lot and away from home. Doctors, tell me more about your family. Now, this is a very sensible conversation with psychotherapists. Now, what the program does is extremely clever. It just takes some patterns, sentence patterns, and then moves around some of the words, turning some of the words that the person was typing, turning it into a question. So, for example, say, oh, nothing much. I'm feeling a bit tired, that's all. And then, why do you think you're feeling a bit tired? It's just a template in the system, moves it around, gives it back as a question. And because the program is using the same words as the other person, the other person thinks, wow, the program understands me. It takes very little to trick others into believing that you understand them. You know, remember the video with the robot that just says, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -hmm, nodding, nodding like that. And then, you know, if something, if, if it doesn't go on, then you just say, oh, it's always a good one. Tell me about your family. You can always say that. Right? <laughs> so, so actually, this guy sent the other people, after this, sent the other people out of the room because it was getting too intimate for him, which is uh, pretty amazing. OK, another instance now of the total Turing test, where you have a physical appearance, is the movie Blade Runner. Is that probably you guys don't know the movie Blade Runner anymore? So who knows the movie Blade Runner? Ah, not on, of course, yes. Uh, some people do, some people. Let me just quickly, so the idea is here. I have the story here. So the film Blade Runner depicts a dystopian, which means disastrous Los Angeles in November 2019, which is actually in the near future, in which genetically engineered organic robots called replicants, visually indistinguishable from adult humans, are manufactured by the powerful Tyrell Corporation. Their use on Earth is banned, and replicants are exclusively used for dangerous work on Earth's off-world colonies. Apparently, Earth has off-world colonies. Replicants who defy the ban and return to Earth are hunted, are hunted down by a special police force known as Blade Runners. The plot focuses on a brutal and cunning group of recently escaped replicants hiding in Los Angeles. The burnt out expert Blade Runner Rick Deckard 
played by Harrison Ford, tries to hunt them down. And there's an interview in which he tries to figure out whether the individual that he's interviewing is a replicant or not. So it's a kind of Turing test, I think, very well done. So Nathan, can we have the, uh, the Blade Runner video? Please don't move. Yep. Sound? Sorry. I already had an IQ test this year. I don't think I've ever had the one. Action of time is a factor in this, so please pay attention. I answer as quickly as you can. Sure. 1187 Hunter Boss. That's the hotel. What? That? Where I live. Nice place? Yeah, sure, I guess. Is that part of the test? No. <laughs> Just warming you up, that's all. Huh. It's not fancy or anything. You're in a desert, walking along in the sand when all of a sudden... Is this the test now? Yes. You're in a desert, walking along in the sand when all of a sudden you look... What one? What? What desert? It doesn't make any difference what desert. is completely hypothetical. But how come I'd be there? Maybe you're fed up. Maybe you want to be by yourself. Who knows? You look down and you see a tortoise, Leon. It's crawling towards you. Tortoise? What's that? You know what a turtle is? Of course. Same thing. I've never seen a turtle. But I understand what you mean. You reach down, you flip the tortoise over on its back, Leon. You make up these questions, Mr. Holden, or they write them down for you. The tortoise lays on its back, its belly baking in the hot sun, beating its legs, trying to turn itself over, but it can't. Not without your help. But you're not helping. What do you mean, I'm not helping? I mean, you're not helping. Why is that, Leon? They're just questions, Leon. In answer to your query, they're written down for me. It's a test designed to provoke an emotional response. Shall we continue? Describe in single words only the good things that come into your mind. About your mother? Your mother? Yeah. Let me tell you about my mother. So uh, you can see the Turing test can be dangerous as well. And uh, the last example that I, I wanted to show you is a video where we have, it's an old video, this, this robot eyeball that was built by Sony about 15 years ago or something like that, and competing with a real dog for a piece of food. And it's kind of a Turing test in the sense that the other, the real dog think that the eyeball is a real dog or not. So can we have that video? It's very short. It's only a few seconds, so you have to you have to watch carefully. Okay. Okay. Okay, so much for the Turing test for animals. Now, uh, just to move on a little bit, still trying to figure out what we mean by intelligence. Another way of characterizing intelligence is, of course, measuring intelligence, right? So how do we measure intelligence? Question to the audience, lo local audience or global audience. Huh? IQ, test. IQ test, right, the IQ test. Of course, the IQ test. And there's a huge literature about the um, IQ test. I think everybody is familiar with it. Is it a good test for intelligence? You think it's a good test for intelligence? No, shaking, you're shaking your head. Mm, 
Maybe not totally, but you know, yeah, something like that. Okay. Do we have no, other opinions, maybe more decisive opinions? Okay, fine. Uh, it lacks of some of information about uh, people who have not uh, logical thinking, like scientific thinking, but uh, from artists or uh, uh, writers. They are uh, intelligent, but they may fail or have uh, lower results on the IQ test, uh, for, my, for my experience. I think, I think that's a really excellent point. You know, it measures certain types of skills, but it doesn't measure other types of skills. So more like these logical, you know, really intellectual types of skills, whereas there are other forms of intelligence that it doesn't measure. I think it's a very good point. In the meantime, there are all, you know, I don't know, about a hundred different kinds of tests that measure certain, or try to measure certain aspects of intelligence. But it's a very disputed thing. Here, uh, yes, question. Uh, you were saying at the start that it's so difficult to define intelligence and there's so many aspects that could there really be a test that measures everything about it? With one single number. I don't think it, I don't think it's possible. I don't think it's possible. Which doesn't will come to that. Which doesn't mean that this test is useless. I mean, it's definitely useful for some aspects, and we'll discuss a little more about it. But it's a good point. Here is a typical item from an intelligent test, and I'm sure who has done an intelligence test. Who knows his or her IQ? No. <laughs> You don't have to tell in public what your IQ is. But. So what's the answer on this, on this item? It's a very typical intelligence test, IQ test item. What's the answer? <laughs> Any volunteers? F. Yes, F. Why? It's correct. Why? Because it's either the same clause and the same. Oh, the third column is the parts that they have in common, the first and the second. Yeah. 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 Right. So you know, it's this, this type of thing. You see, you see what they're actually trying to measure with this. Now, there are a lot of issues with the IQ test. Some of them were already uh, mentioned. And it's a delicate, also politically sensitive issue. Is the IQ in the genes, you know, given at birth, and basically you can do nothing, or is it acquired during your uh, ontogenetic development, or your, during the development from growing from a small organism into an adult. This is the famous nature-nurture debate. We can talk about that. There is a big literature about that. Of course, I mean, if it's if it's in the genes, then basically there's nothing you can do about that. You know, basically just stuck with either a low IQ or a high IQ. You know, unlucky or lucky. But can the IQ be trained? Is it trainable? Can it be increased through practice? If it's in the genes, then not. If it's maybe not only in the genes, then maybe yes. Right. Are there cultural differences? Most likely. There's a big literature about that. And then the next point I find very interesting, professional success. So let me see. Yeah, professional success, I'll come to that in a second. Then there is always this issue of emotional intelligence. You know, they say that, for example, in, in, in the real world, in management, running teams, interacting, emotional intelligence is very important. And typically, the interesting point there is that women are considered to have a higher level of emotional intelligence than men. And then the, the question is, why then is it that women, there are so few women in really leading positions if emotional intelligence is really important for this and men are a lot worse. I mean, these are all politically very delicate issues. 
that we don't need to discuss in detail here, but I just would like to, to mention them. <clears throat> What's the relation to brain processes? Are people with bigger brains more intelligent, or what is it? There are many different abilities. I mean, it's a point that you mentioned, you know, just one, having one number is maybe pretty stupid. Many, many people mentioned that. An interesting phenomenon is the so-called Flynn effect, which is that the IQ, globally speaking, has been increasing over time. I think now it's reached a bit of saturation, but it's been continuously increasing. Why? I think they're, they're all uh, interesting questions. But I, I think I wanted, what I wanted to... mention uh -huh, about the uh, the professional success I, I have to think yeah okay some people some psychologists claim that the IQ is a good measure of a good predictor for professional success so people with a high IQ will more likely be professionally successful now there is I have to quickly see I have uh, slide on that, that that you can maybe see uh, here is one here with the IQ. So there is a organization called the Mensa International, and it is an organization with roughly 100,000 members, I think, worldwide, that score in the top 2% on intelligent tests. On a standard IQ test, this is around 140 or above. While IQ has sometimes been taken as a predictor for professional success, it is interesting that some of the Mensa members are professionally successful and others aren't. Why would that be the case? Now, there's, a, there's an excellent book by... Uh, ah, maybe next week we can also have another student group uh, making a short presentation about why this might be the case. There's an excellent book by Malcolm Gladwell, who is a science writer, a staff writer at the New Yorker magazine and writes popular science. And he discusses, the title of the book is something, it's in the slides, the title of the book is something like The Outliers, The Story of Success. You know, why are people successful? And then he analyzes, for example, the careers of successful people like Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and people like that who all have an IQ of over 140, and, but there are additional factors that need to be in place um, for, for uh, professional success. There are many people who have a very high IQ who are professionally not successful, which is you know, interesting. Why is that? We can look at that in a second. Okay, but now Let's turn to sort of one of my favorite hobbies, which of course it's artificial intelligence. And so what is artificial intelligence? And I think we can do a lot of really interesting research on artificial intelligence without defining intelligence. So we have three goals. One is understanding biological systems. Then, so this can be, you know, can be ants. We're not going to ask, are ants intelligent or not, right? We're not going to do that. can be some kind of animals, but can also be human beings. Then we want to make some abstractions, elaborate principles that not only hold for biological systems, but also for artificial ones. Uh, Ralph, and Ralph, then we try to develop Ralph, applications. For example, Ralph, recently, an application Ralph, has been... You, yeah. Ralph. Ah, oh, question, yes, okay. Ah, I have a proposal for the audience. Uh, maybe you can take all the time that you want uh, and we can uh, move the site presentation to, I think, uh, lecture free when we have more time, no? Because uh, I think it's very interesting people... I, I, if you, I'm almost if you, finished. Ah, you are almost finished, so, okay. So, so I'm almost finished, okay. I can finish in two or three minutes, okay. No, no, well, uh, my proposal was the opposite, I, so take I think it's time. better if I finish now. Okay, so okay, here are some yeah. applications here. Uh, Self-driving cars, which has been in the media, the robot pepper that we looked at before. And here, Hugh Herr from MIT with the bionic limbs. He had amputations of his both legs above the knee. 
He's an extreme climber, and now with his prosthesis, bionic limbs, he climbs, uh, you know, uh, vertical walls, vertical mountains again. So I think a huge success of applications. Then the whole field of service robotics, we will talk about that more later on. So robots, not only in the factory floors, but in our environment. Here, a hamburger machine, a lawnmower, uh, robot waiters, and so on, and many, many medical applications that I will not go into the details. The methodology that we use is called synthetic methodology, understanding by building. So we have a phenomenon of interest, and then we try to build a system that mimics these abilities. For example, how we recognize a face in a crowd, how humans recognize a face in a crowd, or how ants find their way back to the nest when they found some food. And we don't want to copy nature. We want to make abstractions. We want to understand the principles. That's very important. Let me skip this. We will see many examples of the synthetic methodology during the Shanghai lectures. This is just the, the assignment for next week. Think about this. Then the next lecture is going to be on the 22nd of October. So please read chapters one and two of how the body shapes the way we think. Thank you very much for your attention. So Fabio, back to you. Yeah. So I think that now we may take a, a five minutes break and then we may have the um, side presentations. Okay, very good. Okay, okay. See you in five minutes. So we are probably uh, ready to start. Uh, actually, my proposal was to follow the order we have uh, in, in the partner sites on the website. Uh, as told, uh, to, uh, today we will dedicate the, uh, the rest of the lecture to the um, site presentations. And the first one is uh, Adam Mikiewicz University from Poznan in Poland. So, you can start. Uh, hello to everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Pomorski and I would like to uh, describe uh, this short description of Adam Mickiewicz University from Poznan in Poland. So, um, basically we have uh, can I move to another slide? Because okay. So basically, I would like to uh, give some information about our localization, and and then uh, describe some basic facts. Uh, afterwards, I will uh, uh, give the list of faculties, and I will briefly mention about the science uh, which is conducted at this university. So. Um, so we are localized in, in, in Poland, in Europe. Uh, so that's uh, a country which, uh, which is uh, beh between Germany and Russia. And uh, then there is a city of Poznan, which has uh, 550,000 inhabitants. And basically it's as old as Poland. So basically it, it means that it is more than 1,000 years old. So we are localized uh, at Uni Adam Miskevich University at the Faculty of Physics. Okay, uh, next slide. So um, let me uh, briefly uh, give description of basic uh, basic facts about the university. It was founded in 1919, uh, so so it's it's not that old. And actually, Adam Mickiewicz is the name of the, mo the most famous Polish poet. Uh, this university has uh, quite many students. Uh, so the, the approximate number of students is about 42,700. Some uh, 700. And the number of workers um, is also not that uh, is qu also quite big. It's uh, basically 5,500, um, among which uh, 3,900 are academic teachers. And there are 15 faculties uh, at the university. So 
So basically, uh, at the audience right now, uh, we have uh, 17 uh, people from mostly from Faculty of Physics, Biology, and Mathematics, and Computer Science. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, lectures uh, is hosted by by Department of Physics. Uh, um, among other faculties, uh, which are at uh, Adam Mickiewicz University, is Faculty of Chemistry, uh, Faculty of English, Faculty of Polish and Classical Philology, Faculty of Theology, Faculty of Education Sciences, Studies, um, Faculty of Pedagogy and Artistic Science, uh, Faculty of Modern Languages and Literatures. A faculty of History, um, Faculty of Geographical and Geological Sciences. Uh, there is also Faculty of Law and Administration. Um, there is Faculty of Social Sciences. And there is also a Faculty of Political Science and Journalism. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's I just mentioned those 15 faculties. Um, and I, now I would like uh, slightly to s say something about science. So obviously there are many directions, uh, many type of research which is uh, undertaken in Poznan. Um, but I would say the closest uh, type of research related with uh, artificial intelligence lectures could be probably um, associated with evolutionary system study. So there is a field or a subfield of biology, which which name is evolutionary systems biology. There is a web page uh, which is pointed here, and basically uh, the main interest of of the study is building biologically inspired systems like brains, bodies, uh, which combine various time scales scales like behavior development and evolution. And, and there's and, uh, also intersection of many fields of, of, uh, of science, of artificial life, including artificial embryology, evolutionary biology, and computational neuroscience. There is some emphasis on studies of new, spiking neural networks, which are more realistic as we refer to biological um, objects. So basically, there is development of artificial life software platforms and tools for analysis of evolution of genomes, evolution of, of complexity of gene, regulatory networks, and for analysis of biological diversity. Okay, so, uh, and that's probably, that's, uh, I mentioned uh, main facts uh, very briefly, so thank you for your at attention. So, thank you. <laughs> Now it's uh, Chiba's turn. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Wen Wei Yu uh, from Chiba University. Um, we are uh, an assistive robotics group. And today, I just want to go to, um, going to introduce something about the, our location, Chiba, and also our university. So first, the meaning, in order to let you remember us, I will explain a little bit about our, the meaning of this city. It's called Chiba. So basically, the meaning is here. Then I think maybe you can guess uh, it's about pieces, a thousand pieces of leaves. So really, there are a lot of leaves in, during these uh, seasons. Um, then our location. So actually, Chiba sometimes is called the sky gate of Japan. Why, for example, here, oh, here is the, the, the map of the Japan, and this one is a little bit enlarged one. So here is the Chiba University, and we have two uh, airport, international airport. One is called Narita uh, International Airport. Another one is here, it's called Haneda International Airport. If you can draw a line, then you will, fi you will find that Chiba University is just at the middle point of these two uh, international airports. So the next one I'm going to introduce is about this one. Maybe you can see the shape of this. Uh, it's called Chiba, right? Chiba Prefecture. 
uh, actually we have uh, representative like uh, figures. This one is here. Actually, it's some, something like a mouse, something like a bear. So actually, this one is called uh, what do you call? It's fixed uh, the contour of Chiba very well, and uh, we call the Chiba. So you should read it a uh, little bit different with the Chiba. It's called the Chiba. Oh, okay. So Chiba has its different like faces. One of that is uh, kind of like a fishing village and a fishing port. So definitely the sushi, maybe one kind of Japanese food, is very delicious here. So another phase of Chiba is uh, its a metropolitan-like site. So we have a lot of also high buildings. Certainly we also, also have uh, quite a lot of scenery uh, points like this. It's a valley. It's called what? Uh, very beautiful valley uh, with a lot of waterfall there. And also we have actually uh, Narita Inter International Port, sometimes called Tokyo uh, International Port, but actually it's in, the, in our prefecture. And also the Tokyo Disneyland, also it's quite near our university, I think. Uh, if you have time and if you have been, uh, haven't been in Japan, it's really uh, worth visiting. Certainly the cherry blossom here, it's very beautiful. And then also, since we are here and we are this group, I just raised one or two uh, research examples to you. One of uh, our ongoing projects, for example, is this one, a shoulder prosthesis that can cooperate with the normal hands. So I, we have video, but uh, I don't think I can show the videos here. So the idea is to couple in the prosthesis with their users for by manual tasks. So another one is we are building a kind of monitoring robot which can monitor uh, we call a single living elderly uh, in the home in their home environment. All this robot uh, robotic application basically uh, in near future I think all of us uh, one part of us will be the user of this kind of uh, robotic applications. So I will skip the others. So if you really want to uh, visit here, so please call us and contact us. So that's all uh, from Chiba site. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the next is uh, Jungbard the University in Berlin. Okay. Just going to share my screen. Okay, hello, um, I'm Marina Hafner from Humboldt University in Berlin and we're, we've been participating in the Shanghai Lectures for a long time, several years now. So um, Humboldt University is uh, one of three or four big universities in Berlin and uh, actually um, more than 200 years old, so a very old and renowned university and the, um, the one of the big ideas of, of our university is the unity of research and teaching and I think the Shanghai lectures are an ideal example of bringing that together. Um, so Berlin is in Germany, Europe and instead of showing you um, some numbers um, I'm just going to show some very typical figures that are associated with, with Berlin um, I guess you really have to visit us when you um, want to experience the, 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 the full expression of, of Berlin. So um, it goes from Brandenburg Gate uh, to uh, Currywurst, which is a famous um, sausage dish, dish um, invented in Berlin. Um, 
Then our research group um, is called the Adaptive Systems Group. Um, we are, for the sixth time, we're participating in the Shanghai Lectures. This time, you can see some of our research more on the, on the web page. And here are most, most of the members of our group. And um, we are mainly interested in, well, embodied AI and interaction. So interaction um, with the environment, interaction with intelligent agents with the environment, or with others. And one idea is to go, how can, the question, big question is, how can we go from sensory motor interaction, interaction in a physical world, to social interaction and higher levels of uh, cognition? And some of the uh, research topics we're doing are on sensory motor interaction here. We're using, for example, for some of our research, we're using this humanoid robot now. Um, we do experiments on motor babbling, exploration, on internal models, body maps, tool use, to just name a few of our, our research projects. Then we have some more robots here, so we also have some flying robots, uh, some wheeled robots, humanoid robots. They're all used for, for research and some of them also for teaching. And you also see the small Lego Mindstorms, which we will use in the exercises for the, for the Shanghai lectures here, here locally. Then uh, this course here on embodied AI in, as part of the Shanghai lectures is also part of something bigger, a cooperation between um, TU Berlin, Humboldt University and FU Berlin. And it's called the Science of Intelligence Master Track. And if you're studying at one of these universities, you can have a specific selection of courses. And our course in the Shanghai Lectures is one of them. So we can study the science of intelligence, whatever intelligence is after the, the definitions we heard by our five or, um, earlier on. So thank you very much. More information on the webpage and uh, our local organizers here. I want to thank uh, Andreas and Damian for helping us. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, and uh, the next one is the Northwestern Polytechnic University in Xi'an, China. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes. Hello? Yeah. All right, great. So um, my name is Liu Bohan. Um, in case you can't pronounce it, you can just call me Steve. And this is my tutor called Li Xiaohan. And you can also call him Dustin. And we're from the Northwestern Polytechnical University in Xi'an, China. And, I'll, and I'm really happy to give everybody an introduction of our city and our school. And this is also my first time in a global online course, so I'm very proud of it. And this city, it was one of the most important cities in, of ancient China, and now it is, it is still one of the most important cities in modern China. And of course, it will also continue to be really important for our future. And it, uh, hmm? go ahead. Right. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. go ahead. So we can't see the slides yet. Wait a moment. Right. Sorry. We, we, we share the screen. Okay. Nathan, is it okay? Uh, we don't see them yet. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. We we can we can't uh, share the screen now. We just go ahead, okay? Okay. okay. You can maybe upload the slides to the website later, so the others can see it. Mm. Uh, okay. I, uh, we're really sorry for for the problem. It says that the there's something incompatible with our browser, and anyway. <clears throat> if you can see the icon of our school, you, you can find a plane 
and you can find the waves and you can also see a circle of dots. That represents the main focuses of our school, which is aeronautics, astronautics, and marine technology. And Thank you. And I, um, I, uh, my lecturer and I are both from the computer school of computer science, and we have one of the. And I'm really proud to to say that we have one of the top uh, soccer uh, football robots team in China, and we have all we also have a lot of experiment labs on all kinds of things, including um, all kinds of robots and simul simulation pl platforms, and. And our school has a lot of five years experience. Yeah. Five five years experience of what? For lecture for mm -hmm. lectures. Yeah. Well, this this is my first time for the lecture now, so I may be a kind of nervous. But but our school ha already has five years of attending this kind of course, and and everything seems any nice. And well, since. You you can't see since everybody can't see our slides. We'll be uploading the slides online, and if you're interested in in our in our country or in our school, you can always um, visit the websites. And for okay. what is this? And for any one of you who, who who might be going visiting our country or our school, you'll you'll be sure that we will always heartfully welcome you. Thank you. So, and the next one is uh, Russian University for the Humanities from Moscow. Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? No, yes, now we can. Yes, so let us start again. Uh, my name is Vera Zabotkin, I'm Vice Director of International Innovative Projects, but I'm also Director of the Center for Cognitive Studies and Technologies. It's great to be part of Shanghai Lectures family, and we've been participating for six years in this uh, project. I'd like to thank the movers and the shakers of Shanghai Lectures, Nathan, uh, Rod Pfeiffer, uh, Fabio, and others. And uh, though we are humanities, that means art, you can see the picture of our uh, museum. We have nine museums, and education through art is one of the key points at our university. But we also offer training in various fields, including artificial intelligence and robotics. But I'd like to start with a bit of history. We are in Moscow, and uh, back place. And we uh, were founded in 1991, but on the basis of the world famous Institute for History and Archives. Uh, the university comprises 17 institutes, within the institute 16 faculties, 95 departments, 9 research institutes, 26 research education centers, and 14 international research and study centers. There are about 12,600 students studying at our university. It's one of the key well, flagship universities of the humanities in Russia. I mentioned that we offer training at BA, MA levels, and PhD levels in 151 fields, including history, philology, philosophy, psychology, linguistics, anthropology, Eastern cultures, sociology, and intelligence systems, robotics, our information technologies, and others. Um, we award doctoral degrees in 55 disciplines. Um, so, as I mentioned, we've been participating in Shanghai Lectures for six years now, and the students from information technologies, from um, robotics, uh, from uh, computer linguistics are participating in the lectures today. So, our main research interests in the Center for Cognitive Programs and Technologies are cognitive linguistics, cognitive psychology, cognitive philosophy, artificial intelligence, and robotics. You know that modern research should meet should need 
the, the um, demand of I. It should be international, inter sector, connected with other sectors of the economy, and of course interdisciplinary. And all these disciplines are united by the concept of embodiment. Thank you, Rod, for introducing and for teaching us embodiment. So how the body shapes the way we think is the most demanded book at our library. So I'd like to mention a few things about artificial intelligence at our university. So we have machine learning, GSM method of data analysis that was developed by Professor Victor Finn. And this method is applied in evidence-based medicine, uh, cognitive sociology, cognitive forensic star science, attribution of historical documents, pharmaceutics. Uh, we also we are strong in computational linguistics, ontology, and robotics. Speaking about robotics, our robotics center is headed by Professor Vladimir Pavlovsky, who is the key person in Russia in the field of robotics. And of course, the main objective is implementing artificial intelligence methods in robotics. Uh, a new subject introduction to robotics has been delivered here since 2010 and we have already a bachelor program in artificial intelligence robotics. The robot park includes six pop pots, one uh, will be Rovia and never robot. But what is important is our new production. It was done here, Mango project, Mango uh, robot. And it was done by our staff with the help of our students and in cooperation with the Academy of Sciences. This is the robot that uh, can play the world's most famous game called Go, Chinese game Go. And maybe in the future our students can make a presentation about this uh, robot that was actually assembled here, was created at our university. Yes. And uh, you're most welcome to visit uh, our university. It's in the center of Moscow. The campus uh, is very attractive and we have about 900 international students who are coming to study here and the student life is very intense and the research is on the cutting edge. Thank you very much. Okay, in favor of time, we, we will skip a couple of side presentations to, ne to next week. So, we just since these are the Shanghai lectures, so you're not, we will talk about Santana next week and the remaining sites. And we just finish with Shanghai Yao Tong, since these are dubbed the Shanghai lectures. And then Nathan will welcome everybody. You know that Nathan is in actually in charge of uh, not uh, to be downplayed uh, activity of coordinating the whole vid video conference. Okay, so Shanghai is the next. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, and on behalf of the Shanghai Jiao Tong University, I will uh, briefly introduce about our university and our department. Uh, we are located in Shanghai, uh, east of China. So the Shanghai Lecture is uh, original uh, from our university. Uh, this is uh, the location of Shanghai. And uh, here is uh, a beautiful picture about the uh, took in the Bangda area. And uh, about the, our university is uh, the second oldest university in China, uh, established in the 19, uh, in 1896. So uh, our university was called MIT in the East in the 1930s. Uh, we have a very old campus and a very big uh, new campus. Uh, here is a photo of the very old uh, alumni. Uh, come to our university, we have a totally uh, more than 43,000 students and uh, 25 uh, graduate students. Uh, we have the totally around 3,000 faculty. And uh, we have a, a uh, a lot of uh, clusters, including engineering, science, uh, life science, and uh, arts. 
So we have a, a lot of international partners along, uh, around the world, uh, from European, uh, American, and uh, Asia. And uh, we are belong to the School of Electronic Information and Electrical Engineering. Uh, we have uh, the largest, this is the largest school in our university. Uh, and we belong to the Department of Automation. So that is, is uh, the, the ranking, the recent ranking of, of, from the QS ranking. Of course, we also published the Shanghai ranking. It was published in, uh, by some professor in our university. Uh, our department is established in the 1958. We have around 60 faculty members. Uh, we, uh, of course, we took a lot of the, the competition, and uh, here's uh, also some, uh, some more information uh, about uh, our university. Uh, we have uh, some research areas. One is uh, related to the complete, uh, complex uh, system and control, and also we have some process control, and also uh, pattern recognition and image processing and uh, intelligent uh, information processing, and also intelligent robotics and application. We are belong to a uh, list which is uh, area. Uh, we develop uh, different robotic system, uh, like the mobile robot and the robot arm. We also have uh, many cooperation with the industry. Uh, so uh, also we take, uh, took a lot of international activity uh, and so on. So uh, in, of course, including the Shanghai Lecture. This picture show about the first uh, Shanghai Lecture in 2009 when uh, Ralph Pfeiffer was uh, host in our university. So uh, that's all, and uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, now a few words from Nathan, and then I will say goodbye to everybody. Okay, so also from my side, uh, welcome everyone to the Shanghai Lectures. Um, as you may know, I've been a PhD student at the uh, Rolf Pfeiffer's lab, University of Zurich. And um, I would just like to quickly say hello to everyone and uh, lose no. a few words about the history. So um, we started in 2009, uh, we uh, started with video conferencing, website and the 3D world and over the last few years we have always extended the features of the Shanghai Lectures and now we're in the seventh year and you know seven is a magical number, maybe we'll hear about seven in the course of this lecture. Um, seven is a very popular number also in, in uh, movies, for example, there's a bit scary movie, but there's also a movie that's called The Seventh Year Each, so we, the seventh year is always a bit problematic, so we'll see how the seventh year of Shanghai Lectures will uh, turn out to be, but I think with uh, Fabio and many others participating, it should be a success. So we have about 60 sites that have participated since the beginning of the lectures, really around the world. And um, I just want to express my, my thanks to Fabio, Verena, Rolf, Co, Martin for the great work they've been doing the last few years and continue to do. I want to thank Switch, uh, who support our video conference and screen sharing and recording infrastructure. Cyberbotics will provide software for the exercises. University Carlos Tercero in Madrid for the streaming. Osaka University for support. Also Department of Informatics in Zurich to support the lectures. All the lecturers, guests, assistants, tech staff, etc. And most of all, thank you to the students for participating because we are doing it for you and hopefully with you. And so, everyone, welcome to the Global Virtual Lecture Hall and enjoy the Shanghai Lectures 2015.
Thank you. So see um, see you uh, next Thursday, same time, same virtual place. Bye bye.